Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Kubus to Bassani today. He has spoken to us on various occasions and we've always enjoyed his well-researched lectures. Kubus Bassani obtained a master's degree in environmental sciences at Northwest University and a DPhil in history at the University of Free State. During his academic career, he held positions as a researcher and lecturer at three South African and one South Korean university. He retired as professor of history from the Northwest University in Potsdam at the end of 2019, but continues to be an extraordinary professor at the same institution. He is an NRF rated researcher and has produced a large number of books, chapters in books, articles and conference papers. His research outputs have dealt with 20th century South African political history, particularly in the General Smuts and John Foster periods, gender history, Afrikaner masculinities, environmental history, like the evolution of the concept of sustainable development and cultural heritage management. Kubus, thank you very much for preparing this lecture for us. And we're really looking forward to your presentation. Good morning. Over the past two years with this pandemic, we've got so accustomed to restrictions because of the COVID regulations, sanitizing, masks and social distancing, all that. But those things evoke memories of a similar situation that happened about a half century ago in the 1970s when a threat of an oil shortage also caused our government to place restrictions on the general public which affected our everyday lives. I'll give you more detail later. I remember when I was a schoolboy in the 1960s, the price of petrol was so low that it was not really an issue. That situation persisted until the early 1970s. I remember I was a military serviceman in 1973. I was in the Air Force in Pretoria. Later in the year when we got weekend passes, I had a Volkswagen Beetle. And then I would give a lift to three of my buddies and they would each pay two rands. So it's a total of six rand. And that was enough to fill the nine gallon tank of the beetle. And that was enough fuel to take us to Bloemfontein, about 300 miles or 500 kilometers from there. And then on the Sunday, I'll, we'll do the same. Each give two rounds, fill the tank again and go back to Pretoria. At that stage, the price of petrol was about 70 cents a gallon, 15 cents a liter. In those days, those big old gas guzzling V8 chefs and Fords, you'll remember them, they were the order of the day. I remember, you see the picture on the left hand side, my father's big Valiant car, which was the car in which he taught me to drive when I got my license in 1972. Its gear lever was on the steering wheel it only had three gears forward, the engine was strong enough, but what was very convenient was it had a long single seat in the front. So very convenient if you took your girlfriend to the drive-in. You'll still remember how, how popular drive-ins were in those days. Anyway, all of that changed by the end of 1973, that was the end of my year of military service when the oil crisis caused the price of petrol to suddenly climb very steeply. At that stage, just a few months later, my father sold this big Valiant and he bought this small little Datsun 1200 Deluxe. It cost about 2000 rands, I remember. It had a very small engine, was small inside, it was very fuel efficient because it could go more than 50 miles on a gallon of petrol. Mm -hmm. 
it was, by the way, also the first car in which I took the Rina on a date in 1976 when I met her on holiday in Port Edward and I invited her to join me to go to Margate one evening. Now in this talk today I'll focus on that oil crisis at the end of 1973. It was also called the first oil shock and I'll focus on the impact it had on South Africa and especially on the general public and people's everyday lives. I'll first explain what the oil shock actually was, then I'll look at the different factors that helped South Africa to avoid rationing of fuel, then I'll discuss or just mention, you will still remember them, those fuel conservation measures that the government announced. I'll say a few things about the effect it had on people's lives and I'll also mention the response of the public to these measures. And then I'll mention one or two longer term consequences of the oil shock. And then in the last part, I'll come to today, 2022, just to see if there are any comparisons between the oil situation then and today. Right, so what was that uh, oil crisis of 1973? It all started with the so-called Yom Kippur War in October 1973 between Israel and a coalition of Arab states led by Egypt and Syria. In retaliation for Western support for, of Israel, the Arab members of the organization of oil exporting countries or OPEC acted very strongly. At that stage in the early 70s, the world depended for about 95% of its total energy needs on fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas. And Western countries were particularly vulnerable because they, uh, they had to rely very heavily on oil supply from the Middle East, which at that stage possessed about two thirds of the proven world oil reserves. OPEC was established in 1960. At that stage, it had 12 members, half of them Middle Eastern countries. And this organization represented the interests of the oil producing countries and of course played a very significant role in world oil markets. In response to the war, the Yom Kippur War, the Arab oil producing states firstly cut their oil production, they forced the price of crude oil up and they also instituted an oil embargo against Israel's allies. They demanded a complete withdrawal by Israel from the territories it had been occupying since the previous war, the Six Day War of 1967. In the short term, those last few months of 1973, the actions caused severe shortages of petrol and diesel in many countries. You can see how it's reflected in, in some of the photographs. After five months, somewhere around about March or April 74, Israel withdrew their troops from the west side of the Suez Canal. And when that happened, the Arab oil ministers announced the end of the oil embargo against the Western states. But that was not the end of the oil shock because the effects of the actions of OPEC lingered, one could say, throughout the 1970s up to the second oil shock, 1979. The first thing, of course, was that oil prices skyrocketed. In America, from three US dollars a barrel, in October to about 12 US dollars, four times more by the end of that year. And then throughout the 70s, there were more fuel price increases. And in 
And by the end of the decade, the price was about 33 US dollars a barrel. That was 20 times more than at the beginning of the decade when the price was 1.5 US dollars a barrel. Then, of course, it had a ripple effect. More expensive fuel brought rising transport costs, rising production costs, and of course, price increases across the spectrum of commodities. And consumer goods became more expensive. The result, of course, was inflation, increase in the inflation rate, a decline in the GDP of countries, in the economic growth of countries, and economic recession. So what happened was that the oil prices exacerbated the difficulties experienced by the world economy since the start of the 1970s. And the buzzword then was stagflation. No economic growth and inflation price increases combined. So what was the immediate impact on South Africa? Our country did not escape the embargo and its negative impacts because just a month after the first embargo, the Arab oil countries extended the embargo to some other countries, including South Africa. Anti-apartheid groups had been making efforts to get an oil embargo imposed against South Africa for a number of years before that because they believed that that was the Achilles heel of the South African economy. If you cut off the oil supply, then it would force, or maybe hopefully for them, uh, the collapse of the South African apartheid government. From November 73, when the oil embargo was extended to South Africa, our biggest suppliers, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, those three countries supplied about half of our oil imports at that stage. They completely cut off the supply of oil. When the embargo was lifted against the Western countries early in 1974, the sanctions against South Africa remained in force. And they were supported by the Arab states, by the OAU, and by the United Nations. So there was a link between anti-apartheid and the oil embargo then. Well, one would think with this in mind that the oil shock would hit South Africa very hard because the country had no oil supplies of its own, neither on land nor in its territorial waters. And it was the fact that we didn't have our own oil was regarded as our Achilles heel that could threaten our economy. The government in the previous decade had established a company called Sukor. Maybe you still remember Sukor to explore for oil, for oil and for gas on land and offshore. But Sukor never had any luck. They never actually, that was long before most gas later on. So no oil supplies were found. But despite that, South Africa was not in a worse position than most countries because the country depended on oil to a lesser extent than most countries because we had this huge reserve of coal. So coal, even then as now, was used for about 80% of the energy that was needed for electricity generation. Oil was used as, as an energy source for only about 25% of the country's total energy needs. Furthermore, the government, because they feared a shortage of oil, had been planning or contingency measures when such a situation would develop so that there would be oil reserves to use. And their biggest allies in this regard 
were the multinational oil companies. You see the, some of their logos. Those were the ones, Caltex, BP, Shell, Mobil, and Total. Those companies at that stage totally dominated the South African retail market of petrol, diesel, and other petroleum products. And they, during this time, ensured that there was a, still a flow of oil to South Africa to keep their refineries going because they, in the 1950s and 60s, had constructed oil refineries at the port cities of Cape Town and Durban. And these refineries enabled the country to refine the crude oil that it obtained on the international market. And somehow during this whole situation, these multinational companies had plans in place to keep the flow of oil to the country flowing so that their refineries could still operate. The second thing that the government did was to develop the oil from coal technology of Sasol because there was such a huge amount of coal reserves in the country. Early in the century already in the 1920s, they obtained the rights to the German processes to convert coal into liquid oil. Sasol, the company, the South African Coal, Oil and Gas Company was established in 1950. They owned Enterprise and its first oil from coal plant was constructed in Sasselberg, where it still is today. At the start, Sasol experienced teething problems, but the South African government was adamant to subsidize Sasol to keep it going and to get this whole project off the ground. So although by the time of the oil shock, Sasol was producing only a, a small percentage of the uh, petrol and diesel needs of the country, the fact of the matter was that South Africa at that stage was the only country in the world possessing a commercially viable oil from coal industry. And later, of course, as the anti apartheid pressure became more and more, Sasol started playing a bigger and bigger role in the oil strategy of the, of the government. Then the next thing, see it there on the picture in the corner there, it's a picture of the last Shah of Iran because Iran at that stage was South Africa's only ally in terms of oil supply amongst all of the Middle Eastern countries. By 1973, when the embargo was imposed on South Africa in November, Iran was supplying about 40% of South Africa's oil imports. And South Africa, on the other hand, was one of the biggest clients of Iran in terms of oil at a time when there was an oversupply of oil in the world. So it benefited both sides, both South Africa and Iran. The foreign ministers of the two countries at that stage, that it was Ilhat Miller, South African, and Ardashir Zaidi, the Iranian foreign minister, they were personal friends because they were at the same time in the 1960s in London ambassadors of their countries and they became friends there. So because of their close relationship, South Africa and Iran in 1970 established formal diplomatic relations. But there was also another link because the Shah himself had strong sentimental ties with South Africa. His official name was his Royal Highness Mohammed Reza Pahlavi Aryamir, the last Shah. He had sentimental, very strong sentimental ties with South Africa because his father, during the Second World War, found refuge in South Africa and had a house in Johannesburg. The Shah, what were his aims? Firstly, he sought naval cooperation with South Africa and if possible also with Australia, to secure the Indian Ocean against a communist infiltration. So that was his one objective. 
And the secondly, he also needed uranium from South Africa because he had his own plans with nuclear energy for power uh, generation, but eventually also just like South Africa for the production of nuclear arms. So he was willing to supply oil to South Africa when all the other Arab countries cut off their supplies. He said, and I quote, we never mix trade with politics. When all the world trades with South Africa, I don't see why we shouldn't, end of quote. And he repeatedly assured the South African government that Iran would not use oil as a political weapon and would continue to supply oil to South Africa. Sassel, Total, and the Iranian National Oil Company then formed a company to construct the refinery, the, what was called the Natrev crude oil refinery at Sasselberg, which was then completed in 1971, which was strategically important for South Africa because from then on, the country could purchase oil directly on the market from suppliers and refine that oil at its own facility in uh, Sasselberg, which was uh, critically important to the fuel security of the country. The other thing that was also done to safeguard the country against the consequences of uh, oil shortage was stockpiling. Already in the 1960s, they formed a council, a coordinating council, to plan for the stockpiling of strategic reserves, especially oil. State aid was given to the oil companies to carry the maximum quantity of commercial fuel supplies. And the money for that was channeled through special funds, the Foreign Procurement Fund and the Strategic Fuel Fund. Sufficient storage capacity was created in above ground tanks. Those of you who visited these refineries will know that there are these huge oil tanks where they keep a stockpile of their oil, but they also used disused coal mines. They identified four old coal mines near Uchis in the Transvaal, and those were converted for oil storage. By 1972, they were ready, and they were filled with 169 million barrels of oil. That was enough oil for probably about 18 months if oil supply would be cut off completely. Thus, to summarize, to avert the threat of an oil embargo, the South African government before 1973 went to great lengths to decrease its overall dependence on imported oil by developing a multi-pronged energy policy. It spent millions of rands on refineries, pipelines, you remember the pipeline between Durban and Jobo, for example, special offshore terminals, oil from coal production, Sassel, a fruitless search for oil in South Africa and Southwest Africa, and the establishment of oil reserves in tank farms and disused coal mines. Now, how did the government respond to the oil crisis at the end of 1973. John Forster was then Prime Minister of the National Party government, the apartheid government at that time. The first reaction was one of uncertainty. Even if they had plans in place to safeguard the country against an oil shortage, there was a lot of uncertainty of what the oil embargo would entail. And the reports by banks, for example, economic reports by banks and by the Federated Chamber of Industry, and all of them painted quite a gloomy picture of what might be the consequences of this oil embargo. For example, that it would really 
a restrict manufacturing that the industrial section would be hit very hard and so forth. So people were very uncertain about what would actually happen. And by the end of 1973, there was a, a strong likelihood of oil rationing, just like in the Second World War, when fuel was rationed. And the government drafted regulations for the rationing of the distribution of petroleum products. And these, if they were needed, could be published at very short notice. So they were ready for rationing. Foster, of course, when the oil shock hit, he immediately consulted his economic advisors. And the first response was to increase the price of fuel. So even before the embargo was extended to South Africa, the price of petrol became much higher. Uh, the pump price of petrol increased from about 12 cents a liter before October 1973 to by the end of that decade, 79, because there were several price rises, to about 54 cents a litre in 1979 of this, the second oil shock. So within six years, the petrol had become four times more expensive than what it had been before. The government also set up committees to look at different possibilities of how to save oil, how to restrict the use of, of petroleum products, and also to develop a more comprehensive energy policy for the country. Uh, state officials started drafting a memorandum. And in that memorandum, the possibility of fuel rationing was mentioned, but that was at the end of 73, just before the holiday season. So what they said in the memo was that, well, holiday season is usually the peak time of travel and so on. So let's wait till after the holidays and see what situation is then. And if we need it, we can then impose the, the rationing. But they also said in the memo that the public must be made aware of the seriousness of the situation through an information campaign. And it must be used to get the public to reduce the consumption of petrol and diesel and so on. Then in November, when the embargo was extended to South Africa on the 13th of November, November 1973, Foster then announced this set of fuel conservation measures. You still remember the speed limit was reduced from 120 to 80 on the open road and from 60 to 50 in urban areas. You also remember, if you look at the middle pictures, the service stations were closed. The petrol pumps were closed six o'clock in the evening. They only opened six o'clock next morning and the same over the weekend. Friday afternoons closed and only reopened Monday mornings. Also, you were not allowed to store extra petrol, only five liters for your lawnmower. And then also fuel for pleasure was prohibited. No motor racing, no pleasure rides on private aircraft, no pleasure boats and skiing and all that were banned. But Forster, when he announced these measures, he assured the public that the government's aim in dealing with this whole crisis was to cause as little disruption as possible. And the other government spokespersons, ministers and so on, they appealed to the public to regard fuel saving as an act of patriotism in the national interest. So what was the impact on the man in the street, the ordinary people? Most of you will remember those days. Those fuel conservation measures remained in place for, for a number of years, till late in the 1970s. And they were, you will remember, quite a nuisance. For example, 
if you wanted to travel over the weekend, the distance was restricted to the distance that your car could travel on a tank of fuel. And perhaps if you add your five liter can, those extra five liters. So in my case, for example, where I lived in Bloemfontein at the time, if I wanted to visit family or friends in Joburg or Pretoria, you had to take the Friday off and the Monday so that you could get there and back. You couldn't travel there and back on one tank of petrol. And also if you wanted to travel further, like uh, I also did in the, at that time, Cape Town from Bloemfontein, the first thing is your travel time was much longer because now you had to drive much slower. So it's three or four hours longer to get to your destination. And also it cost a lot more because all of a sudden the price of fuel was like three times more than it had been before. The expensive petrol, the restrictions on the hours of sale of petrol and the reduced speed limit also made it difficult to plan for holidays. So you can understand why our family for that holiday went to Marcelsport rather than East London. But these measures were relatively successful. They were very effective because they forced people to cut out unnecessary travel and to plan very carefully if it was necessary to travel. And also then the smaller cars that I mentioned at the start became a selling point because you remember that was about the time when the big old Chefs and Fords disappeared and the little Datsuns and Toyotas and Mazdas started coming into the market. That was exactly the time when my father bought the Datsun. So our family also, to, an, to some extent, did our bit to save fuel. South Africa eventually was one of the few countries in the world that succeeded in drastically curtailing the consumer demand for oil after the 1973 crisis. And after that, the contribution of oil to the total energy demand of the country came down to under 20%. So the other 80% were made up by coal and other types of energy. The annual increase in petrol consumption in the country was as low as 0.8% from 1974 to 1978. But one must remember that was also a time of economic slowdown, so that also played a role. In the end, rationing was avoided. Towards the end of March 1974, that Coordinating Council, which I mentioned, reported that the stock position of petroleum products remained fairly constant. Minister uh, Owen Orwood at that time was Minister of Economic Affairs, I think, and he later became Minister of Finance. He went to Iran at the time, and there he signed a trade agreement with Iran, which also covered oil supply. Iran's government gave assurances to the Foster government that it would not halt or reduce oil or exports to South Africa. And Iran actually stepped up their oil exports to South Africa to 254,000 barrels a day. Reportedly, Iran provided 90% of South Africa's crude oil imports between 1974 and 78. By 1976, there was no longer a looming shortage of fuel, but fuel savings were continued, the measures were continued to curb imports of petroleum products so as not to exacerbate the balance of payments problem. Now, how did the people of South Africa, the general public, how did they respond? I got this from the internet. It's a recent retrospective article dealing with the fuel restrictions written by a man with the name of Stuart Johnson. And he wrote the following, he says, the government immediately announced 
emergency measures to cope with this crisis. Fuel sales were prohibited between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. daily and on weekends, and all motorsport events were cancelled. What's worse, the speed limit on the open roads and freeways was cut from 120 kilometers an hour to 80. It was the only way, said the government, that we would have any chance of getting through the crisis. What was remarkable was how the motoring public crossed the realities of our situation and obeyed the laws religiously. And if you were so selfish as to venture out onto the roads in a gas guzzling V8, you risk the wrath of your community. Maybe if there's time when I finish, some of you may have memories of those days, so you're welcome to share it with us. But anyway, measures made everyday life more difficult, especially for middle-class people that own cars. But surprisingly, there was almost no resistance to these measures. In fact, the governing party, the National Party, increased their majority at the elections in 1974 and 1977. Of course, there were other factors, many other factors as well, but it just shows that there was not really uh, much resistance to these austerity measures. The fact of the matter was that although these measures were inconvenient, they didn't really had any impact on the standard of living of white people in South Africa in those days. On the contrary, economic data shows that the real income of white South Africans did not decline in the 1970s at all, but actually reached a peak by the end of that decade. So for white South Africans, it was the best of times. Foster's appeal to the public to adhere to these measures as an act of patriotism had the desired effect for the government. Far from alienating white voters, it actually contributed to solidarity among especially the more conservative white people in the country at that stage, who really believed that adherence to these uh, conservation measures was a patriotic deed. So I would say the fact that the National Party got a record majority in the 77 election was because the majority of the voters, who were only whites at that time, felt that this was the party that best guaranteed the maintenance of the status quo of white privilege at the time. In the end, this oil shock also had a serious impact on the South African economy in macroeconomic terms. The same woes, economic woes that affected all the other countries in the world as a result of the oil shock, things like price rises, inflation, the recession, all those things also affected South Africa. The higher fuel price caused transportation, construction, manufacturing costs, all those things to rise. And higher input costs, of course, increase the cost of production of goods and services. So inflation was accelerated. The upward wage price spiral was not under control anymore. Before 1972, inflation rate was in single digits. But by the end of 1974, the final quarter of 1974, the inflation rate in the country was higher than at any other time at 17.8%. 17.8% is, is very high. The uh, current parameter of the government is between 3 and 6%. Thus, one could say that although South Africa did not experience debilitating fuel shortages in the wake of the oil shock in end of 1973, the oil crisis was a factor, was definitely a factor, an important factor in the weakening of the country's economy. It was just about the time when there was a transition from a booming economy, very booming economy in the 60s and beginning of the 1970s, 
to a declining economy. If you read economic history books, you'll see that our economy actually declined consistently from the late 1970s, even up to today. So what one can say is the, that the oil shock of 1973 was a major event in the world. It had a major impact on the world economy and even South Africa, country that was better prepared than most countries for a cut in oil supplies could not evade its consequences. Now today is almost 50 years later, 48 and a bit later than when it first struck. And what I want to conclude with is to just have a look at a comparison between the oil situation then, end of 73, and now in 2022. Many questions come to mind. For example, is our dependence on fossil fuels today still such that we can expect further oil shocks or are fossil fuels on the way out? Is a fuel shortage possible? And should we prepare for further hikes in the petrol price? Now, global warming and climate change, we know that those are the things that are at the very top of the international agenda today. And the large scale use of fossil fuels tops the list of factors contributing to climate change. So the environmental movement for that reason is exerting more and more and more pressure on governments and big business to move away from fossil fuels for energy supply and to switch to low carbon renewable energy sources. It is not so easy to achieve this because of several reasons. Firstly, fossil fuels, excellent sources of energy. Easy to generate energy from fossil fuels and to capture the energy produced during fossil fuel combustion. Fossil fuel, their energy density and ability to provide very high heat are qualities that are very difficult to replicate in other sources of energy. Secondly, fossil fuels are not only sources of energy. Fossil fuel raw materials are extremely important for the production of almost anything. Almost everything in your house is in some way derived from fossil fuel raw materials all plastics, for example, almost all building material. So that's the second thing. Thirdly, oil, coal and gas remain the lifeblood of the modern economy. Both as an energy source and as raw material, fossil fuels are a multi-trillion dollar industry. They still provide 85% of all energy consumed in the world and generate 64% of today's global electricity supply. They are still the backbone of all transport systems. And then the fourth reason, fossil fuels are plentiful and relatively inexpensive. And for that reason, it will be very difficult to switch, to replace them. Although their supply is finite, they are still relatively abundant and the technology to extract them continues to improve, making them ever more economic to produce and to use. Substitutes for fossil fuels is in, a, in the process of being developed, but not yet fully developed. So the conclusion is fossil fuels won't just disappear altogether within a few years. In some scenarios, fossil fuels will still provide 60% of energy by 2040, and by 2050, energy supply may still be mainly fossil fuel based. Some experts say that a world that doesn't rely on fossil fuels at all may never exist. In certain sectors, for processes that can't run on electricity, fossil fuels will still be needed for quite some time. For these processes, the world will need zero carbon fuels that mimic the properties of fossil fuels, energy dense fuels that can be burned. Those are still in the process of being developed. 
In our current situation in the 21st century, we live in very interesting times because we are experiencing the next great energy revolution. The world has had wood, then coal, then oil, and now we have a transition to new sources of energy which will lessen and eventually end the reliance on fossil fuels. And much progress has already been made with the rolling out of green energy in the form of renewable resources. We all know solar and wind power, for example. So the wind turbines, we recently drove to the West Coast and there are more and more wind farms along the road. And also the solar photovoltaic or PV cells. Well, around us there in Vermont, just about all the neighbors have put solar panels on their roofs already. Costs for wind and solar have been dropping rapidly and they are now mainstream cost-effective technologies, which will eventually eliminate CO2 emissions from the electricity sector. So the energy mix is definitely starting to change. Renewable energy sources already supply about 26% of the world's electricity today. And this share is rising all the time. The expectation is that green technologies will slowly replace fossil fuels over the coming decades. Research reports claim that it will be possible for solar and wind power to price fossil fuels out of the electricity markets by the mid 2030s and that by 2050 renewable energy can replace fossil fuels entirely. Then they also develop other forms like biofuels, combustible hydrogen and so on. So what I try to say is that huge strides have been made to move toward a low carbon future. If we look at cars for example, there's a process of phasing out petrol and diesel cars and many countries have already set targets for this like the UK for example from the year 2030 the sale of new petrol and diesel cars will be prohibited and five years later 2035 also hybrid vehicles so the petrol and diesel cars will still be available in the second hand market but with no new models allowed to be sold they will slowly and surely disappear. Most of the well-known car manufacturers, all the big companies, have already planned fossil fuel vehicle phase-out roadmaps, as they call them. So eventually they will all switch to other types of cars. The focus is in the development of electric and hydrogen fuel cell cars. Electric cars are much more uh, efficient than internal combustion engines and they're much simpler mechanically because they need fewer moving parts but they have their own challenges for example the, the weight of the batteries is a problem still for for tesla and the others for a passenger car not so much but if you think of aviation maritime shipping long-haul trucking where the vehicle must carry heavy loads for long distances without refueling the difference in energy density between fossil fuels and batteries is still a huge challenge. Irina and I recently visited Australia, our children there, and Tesla, for example, you see the picture there, is a very popular brand there already. And I checked a number of charging points in cities and on the main roads in Australia, for example, is increasing fast. In South Africa, we still lag behind, but eventually when the auto manufacturers stop manufacturing petrol and diesel models, we'll be forced to make the switch. I can also say a few things about the aircraft industry where they are also moving to alternative energy sources, but my time I see is running it out, so I'll not do that. So, we in this hall today, members of the Hermanus U3A, will we live to see the full transition to cleaner, low carbon and renewable energy? A transition that's growing more and more urgent, but certainly won't happen overnight in the 2020s, maybe in 20 years from now, but then most of us will 
not be here anymore. In 20 years from now, maybe we won't use electricity generated by coal anymore. We won't drive cars powered by petrol anymore. We won't fly in planes propelled by <coughs> kerosene or jet fuel anymore. The bottom line is that our generation, we here, yeah, will still use fossil fuels for the rest of our lives. So what will happen in the next few years, we will still be subjected to possible shortages of oil and to increases in the price of petrol and diesel. If you look at that graph, for example, that's the oil price. You see it took a very big dip in 2019 and 2020, but now it's rising and now with the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, it's rising even more. So unforeseen events like that, they drive the oil price up. So just like in 1973, when the Yom Kippur War caused the first oil shock, we don't exactly know what the eventual consequences of the Russian invasion will be on the oil price. It's a bit fluctuating at the moment, but it's above $100 and might even still go further up. Are we facing a possible shortage of fuel? The problem is that there is a gradual decline in the demand for fossil fuel. And therefore the oil companies, the investment in the production of fossil fuels is dropping. Think for example, our case in South Africa, some of those refineries to which I referred have closed down and others are also in the process of perhaps being closed down. So we will be get up our fuel from them. In the short to medium term, while the oil and gas companies come under pressure to reduce production, the world's thirst for new supply is growing. When the COVID pandemic struck, people thought that maybe that will reduce the need of oil. But the expectation is that now when the economy is picking up again, the demand will soon increase to 2019 levels and even beyond that. It is expected that demand for oil and gas will surpass supply in the not so distant future. And the discrepancy between the political desire for less fossil fuels and the global hunger for fossil fuels could drive the price of oil up even further than what we have now. So to conclude, I just want to say that we as U3A members, our generation will still be subject to oil shocks. Maybe not our children and grandchildren, they may be free from this threat because then by that time fossil fuels will be phased out. But they will probably be facing other, perhaps even worse challenges than our generation. Just before I uh, conclude, I just want to remind you, it's 22nd of April today, it's Earth Day, the first Earth Day was was in the United States of America in 1970. So it's, the, it's 52 years today since the first Earth Day. So please, when you go home, keep that in mind and do something today to help save our planet. Thank you. If there's anybody with memories of that time, yes, the is going to stand here. I, I bought a little Datsun like that in 1971 a blue one and then I moved to England and it stayed with my parents and then uh, in Rhodesia I bought it and in those days we had fuel rationing because of UDI sanctions. You got seven coupons, farmers got more and if you had an overseas visitor you could apply for more. So in for Christmas 1974 I went home for Christmas but then we had to come down below. We had load shedding in England during 1974, three hours at a time. The day was divided into three bands. Black band, you were definitely load shedding. Gray band, perhaps white band, you were free. So we had severe load shedding in 1974. And when I came out, we had to come down uh, for, for uh, after Christmas down to the Cape. And do you know what it was like to drive from Sonoya to Noi, right up there 
down to Somerset West, only being allowed to do 55 miles an hour and filling up between six and six. It was a nightmare. So I have these memories of 1974. Thank you very much. And my Datsun was a lovely car. I had something to do with alternative energy in the early 1980s. I was working for Bateman Engineering and we did two very big feasibility studies for sugar um, and ethanol produced from sugar cane. So purpose built sugar mills with a, an ethanol production facility tax on the back of them. And the one was for a Central American country, which never got built, I don't think. And the other one, interestingly enough, was in Zimbabwe, in Triangle. And that did get built, and to my knowledge, it's still working. So they've been producing alcohol from sugarcane in Zimbabwe since about the mid 80s. I can remember during the, uh, when we were restricted on speed, we used to freewheel down the hills. Didn't switch the engine off because you need your vacuum brake, but just pop it into neutral and cruise down hills. And on one occasion, uh, quite a nice long hill with plenty of visibility. I just let it run. And I think I was getting up to about 100 kilometers an hour. Yeah, I went past a big car and the big performance hooting and waving, you're going too fast. And then it, I took no notice, him, kept going past him and carried on. And then he chased me in his big V8. So he was way over the speed limit. Just one of those stories. <laughs> anyway, thanks for that. So that's my story. Thank you for coming.